David here. Welcome back to the DGR podcast. This is episode number 40. I hope everyone is doing well. Today, I have a very interesting guest, a very interesting guy, a very interesting coach. I have Grant Fowler from Fowler Fitness. Um, if you follow Grant on Instagram, you'll know that he's a, a guy that's relatively outspoken with like unique ideas and unique thoughts on things. So I think it was really good to have a chat with Grant today. We kind of just got straight into the chat. I had to like I had to say to him, like, say that again and press record because we were just chatting straight away. And um, often some of the best things happen before the podcast, before you actually hit record on the podcast. So um, I'm trying to make sure I capture the before and after of the podcast as well. Um, uh, that kind of organic chat. And I want it all to just be kind of an organic chat. So we were kind of chatting about business and social media at the start. Um, so you'll hear us go straight into that. We chatted a little bit about programming for kind of online or remote clients. We chatted a little bit about injury, nutrition, slash supplementation, red light therapy, um, and lots more. So I think you're really going to enjoy the chat. Without further ado, here's Grant. Okay, we're on. Uh, keep going. Keep saying what you're saying. Social media is helping. Yeah, so I think, you know, in the past, I want to say six months, maybe even a year, because it was probably around maybe a year ago that I think Instagram came out with the real feature, which was kind of, you know, along the same lines as the TikTok algorithm. Um, I'm no expert in like the Instagram algorithm, but I did notice, you know, a, a massive difference in how um, easy it was to get information out to people just with that real feature. Um, you know, you can post a video, uh, not even a flashy video. It could be a simple video of you doing a bicep curl. Um, and it, you know, blows up and gets like half a million views or even more. Um, I've posted videos that have gotten, you know, six or 7 million views easily that were just videos of me doing jumps, you know? And I think, especially for people now that are putting out really good information, it's a easy, it's an easy way to get really good information out to people that otherwise wouldn't see it. Right. Because the way the algorithm works now is it's not so much, okay, you have 10,000 followers, so we're going to show your account to this many people, or you have 100,000 followers, so we're going to push your content out to this many people. Now it's fair game. It's equal game for anybody. You know, you can have uh, 10 followers, you can start an Instagram page or a TikTok um, and blow up overnight. So it's, it's a two-way street. You know, you have a lot of people putting out really bad information. And then now it's weird because you almost have an equal amount of people, um, maybe not equal, but it, I think it's getting there or it will get there at some point, um, putting out really good quality information um, or at least information that is, you know, I think in our niche, it's really hard to define quality information because everybody's so nitpicky about what's right and what's wrong. So maybe within our niche, it's not. But I think when you're talking about, you know, the general public, um, you know, some of these really basic things like, you know, get more sunlight, uh, eat good food uh, is probably a massive paradigm shift for a lot of people. So as far as social media goes <clears throat> and my own business, you know, it's it's allowed me to reach a lot more people. I wouldn't say that, you know, I'm a TikTok influencer yet or an Instagram influencer. I think I need at least 50,000 to and consider you, myself. In, in your bio, because the first question I had written down before you even started talking about that was, you have anti-dogma, anti-influencer, yep. and anti-professional. Yep. I don't want to be an influencer, but what, I know some does people it, what will... What does influencer mean? You know, I think it's hard to define, but I think, you know, with the type of people that, you know, we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, <clears throat> it's not being an influencer would be putting, you know, quality information out over um, just sensationalized you know, stuff. I think a lot of people, and, it, and don't get me wrong, like there is definitely a time and place to kind of tailor, you know, the way that you're putting out information to make it more appealing to people to kind of catch people's attention. Mm -hmm. um, but I like to use it kind of as bait, right? It's like, it's, there's a flashy component to it, but then you reel people in with, you know, quality information as, as opposed to just putting out, um, you know, things that are going to just catch people's attention uh, just so you can kind of funnel them into, you know, some bullshit product that you're trying to sell. So that would be an anti-influencer, I guess, if I could define it. Yeah, I think you're doing something interesting. I was just on your so your Instagram there. 
So I, I, I almost consume like zero content now for the last while. No, that's bullshit. I, I consume very little content. When I'm on Same. Instagram, I'm pretty much on yep. my page. But yep. um, I just had a look there and um, and I kind of remembered as well what, what, you, what I noted about you for a long time was you don't try and dumb things down at all on your on your post like and often you're not trying to like shorten your post you're not trying to dumb it down maybe but maybe maybe, maybe you are sometimes it, like but right there's, right there's a full caption there a lot of the time a lot of time it's like continued in the comments yep. and stuff and that that's filtering out people who don't give a shit about that information 100 like, percent. you're attracting the people that you want to attract there yes yeah and that's i think part of it where you know you can have a lot of my videos do not match the caption like you would see one of the videos and you'd be like okay this is just gonna be some you know uh it's just me showing off some skills or something you know and there's gonna be no caption and then you read it and it's like the caption the the video is just a way to kind of bait people into reading the caption and like half the people that see it probably are only gonna get halfway through the caption but that's what i want you know because then it's it filters it to where it's like okay now i can reach a lot of people which is great because in that large pool of people, there's going to be maybe five or 10% that do read it and do care. Um, and then, you know, half of them that follow you just because they saw a cool video are probably just going to end up unfollowing you later at some point anyway. Mm -hmm. But I was actually talking to uh, Kyle Dobbs recently about that and just like consuming less content. Um, and that's something that I've been doing a lot recently. There's a very few accounts that, you know, like when I actually see something or see somebody post it, it's actually thought provoking for me enough. So mm -hmm. when I post something, I want it to be, um, even if it is kind of like a normal topic that people discuss a lot, I always want there to be an edge there where there's kind of something that people can take away from that and kind of consider something, you know, that might be normal or boring and maybe like a slightly different light, if that makes sense definitely does I, I kind of fell into the trap for a while i kind of fall in and out of it like thinking oh what what do people want to see here like what's good for the algorithm right. which is important to understand like it is important to understand but then i was like you know what i just need to fucking post the thing that i'm thinking about and i want to talk about exactly it. The people who my customers are are actually just the people who like my talks whether they agree yes. with them or not they like like consuming and, and having just reading my thoughts about things or seeing my thoughts about things not what i think they should be thinking about or, or reading so i always fall into that trap but then i kind of snap myself out of it eventually yeah i've been kind of back and forth it, it might not seem like it but you know there's been times especially in the past where i've done that and i think even though you might not see as much growth overnight, I think you get yourself into a position where, you know, you're setting yourself up for long-term success a whole lot better because one, you're, I mean, when you're dealing with people, you're always going to have to deal with some bullshit. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's people that are really interested in training or they're people that just got into fitness. Um, I think people that, you know, are, are kind of new to fitness usually are a little more difficult to deal with because they have a ton of questions um, you know, the same can obviously be true with, you know, people kind of in our niche, but I think when you do focus on putting out higher quality information, you kind of filter out a lot of people that, you know, are a hassle to work with and also people that are, that are going to not stick to your program and then kind of give you a bad name. Right. So when I first started training a lot of like people in person, I noticed that, you know, cause I was just taking clients because I needed, that was my full I was doing that for um, a living at the time that was all I did and so I needed to kind of fill those spots obviously to make money but what I noticed is that a lot of the kids that weren't getting results were going back to school and then um, there would be other kids that wouldn't want to train with me because they're like well you didn't get any stronger doing that and then the kids like well yeah I don't know I mean I did it for four months and I just didn't notice anything and it's like dude you showed up twice a week yeah. once or twice a week you know and you didn't put in the effort so there's that, there's that side where like, if you almost, it, I almost think it's better for people to kind of start out with fitness as like a side hustle, maybe do something else and then slowly kind of integrate it into your life where now you've built up this business slowly over time. 
and you have, you know, you've tailored your message to a group of people that you know are going to be dedicated to, you know, your process. Um, they care about it. So they're probably going to be long-term clients. You know, I would say 70 to 80% of the people that I work with, um, you know, on my remote coaching platform now trained with me for at least a year. Um, some of them I've been training for, you know, three to four years. Um, so I think when you tailor your message the right way and you put it out there, you know, with the specific intent to almost filter certain people out, uh, you're going to have a much better outcome, you know, long-term. Yeah. I agree with you hundred percent there. Um, like in rehab as well, very much so. like what you're saying about giving your, giving people, giving you a bad name. If you, this is why, like, you know, when I, I get someone coming into me and they say, I've seen six physios and I have knee pain and I can't get back. And then they start like absolutely bitching about the last physio. They didn't help me this and that. Like, yeah. I don't, I don't get into that with them at all because half the time in fairness to the other physio or whatever, it's bullshit. What the person in front of you is, is you is actually saying like, right. They went to them once or twice and then they just went and tried to do a 10 K run and maybe the physio that wasn't the directive whatsoever but now they're just yeah. giving the physio and they've told all their friends like that guy was shit uh um, yeah so like from the start I, I try i try and tell someone okay here's what i think it's going to take to get you back to doing whatever you want to do and if they like if we're at session six and i think not even session six let's just say we're at a certain stage and i've told them you're not ready to run yet we're still working through some of your plyometrics and they come back in the following week and their knee is in bits I'm like, what did you do? What did you do? Right. This is Wednesday, the session is. What did you do Tuesday? What did you do Monday? What did you do Sunday? Like, I know pain, yeah. all pain isn't like perfectly explainable, but I wanted to know right. what you did. And, and inevitably they'll go, oh, I just went for a quick 10K jog. I'm like, do not fucking put this on me <laughs> that, that if, if you end up with knee pain and back to the start again, like we've, we've been very clear, this is how we're going to do it. And honestly, I've had less of that now because I actually attract more of the more of the right people and i'm more clear from the start around this is what i expect from you and this is what you can expect from me so i think that's very 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 important yeah and i think you know even when it comes to that's why it's difficult to you know tell whether somebody didn't have success because they weren't doing the right exercises or they didn't have success because they didn't take what they were supposed to do and you know either apply it correctly either they do too much or they don't do enough and so you know, like I'm not a fan of clamshells. I know you're not a fan of clamshells, but it's like, I would almost rather have somebody. And I'm not saying that that's a completely bad exercise either. I think there's probably application there, but um, I would almost rather have somebody do something that I, I will, you know, I know isn't going to be the best thing for them to do and just do it with a ton of intent than to, you know, have somebody uh, do all the right exercises, but either put no intent into it or they do too much. Um, I remember, I, I think I took a LDOA course that's basically kind of like a, it's like FRC for the spine almost mm -hmm. like three or four years ago. And, you know, the spine stuff I think is great, but there were some weird things as far as, you know, some of the exercises they were using for, um, just like training the glutes. Like it's probably just not stuff that I would ever, you know, program for somebody, but then I was oh, looking at about decompression a lot. For yes. The spine, do they? Yeah. 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 And I think some of that has some merit. Um, you know, I've tried it and felt pretty good with it, but then there were other components of it that just seemed, um, you know, strange to me in terms of like some of the accessory exercises for like, you know, glutes, it's like just a bunch of sideline leg raises, which are, you know, I think that's an okay exercise, but it was like, you know, you're going to go do uh, 2000 sideline leg raises. And I'm thinking, why the hell would anybody have somebody do 2,000 sideline leg raises? But then it hit me, and I was like, it's just simple. It's training the glute, and it's just giving somebody, like, a ton of work to do that they can't bullshit. If you're going to do 2,000 sideline leg raises, like, in some way, you can't – like, if you give somebody, like, one or two sets, um, that person has to be very, like – in. they have to internalize what they're feeling – they have to put a lot of effort into that. You know, it's kind of like the old, I think it was Mike Mincer and the high intensity bodybuilding stuff. And there were a ton of people saying, oh, this isn't working. It's only one set, blah, blah, blah. And then you look at the intensity they're putting into it. And it's like, dude, you don't even have the work ethic to be able to make that type of training work for you, mm -hmm. you know? And so 
maybe you do need to go do like 2000 sideline leg raises Mm -hmm. just to, you know, be able to accumulate enough like reps and intensity to even do anything. Mm -hmm. And so it's really funny. It kind of goes back to like my style of training where, you know, I wouldn't really call it the minimal effective dose, but it definitely is kind of on the lower end in terms of like volume. And it's 50, 50, you have some people that, you know, they'll message me and they're like, I'm not noticing any strength gains, blah, blah, blah. You have other people that, um, you know, see massive results from it. And then when I go to review, you know, their videos, you can see like a clear difference in, okay, these people are getting results because they're putting a ton of intensity or whatever focus, you know, maybe it needs to be, um, less intensity, but more like internalized, um, it, it kind of depends, but I've noticed that, you know, the people that are not getting the results that they want, um, are not putting that focus. You can visibly see it in the exercises they're doing. And then the people that are getting the results are, you know, giving it a hundred percent. And so I think that kind of goes back to, you know, rehab, choosing the right exercises. A lot of it just comes down to the person. Yeah. I think, I think intensity is a skill that like takes time to learn and it's a few few components to it like confidence confidence a lot of people just don't have the confidence especially in my world i suppose but probably in most people's worlds like when they they just don't have the confidence to push themselves that hard they don't know what's going to happen so that takes time to build up and then it's a skill to learn to be able to actually like just push and push that aggressively push that hard um i grew up playing sports and i never really only when i moved clubs at one stage and we had a I was a little bit, I, I wasn't, I thought I was in okay shape, moved to a new club and it was, the intensity was just up at a serious level and I suffered for the full season and the next season I came back just with a mindset of fuck this, like I'm gonna, I'm <laughs> going to hit this in, in, in very, very hard. And yeah. It felt like I couldn't get to that mindset in season. I needed a break to like sit back and say to myself, okay, like I can't have another season of that. So that intensity took me just in that in that kind of training and i had trained my whole life playing football but it took me a good 12 months to even be able to contemplate hitting that hit that level of intensity so yeah yeah and i think that's kind of the flip side is you know you have two different kinds of people you have you know the people that aren't getting the results because they're not putting that intent into the training and you have some people that need to learn how to actually relax you know and and maybe i hate to say it but like give a 70 percent effort you know there's a lot of people and i think that is why some of the PRI stuff is so big for people, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, well, you know, it's not, maybe they had a client that needed to push a little bit harder and they didn't get the results they wanted from it because they don't have that intensity there. But then you take somebody else that maybe needs to take things down a couple notches, maybe stop externalizing things so much, especially if you're an athlete and you're used to doing that kind of breathe, internalize things. Uh, maybe give like a 70% effort and kind of learn how to build up some of that effort within the context of almost learning how to maybe be a little more relaxed. Mm -hmm. Um, It sounds kind of weird, but I think for a lot of people, that's why, you know, maybe some of the lower threshold stuff doesn't work for some and then works great for others as well. Um, And that comes back down to just the individual, you know, where are they at? Um, You know, and then can you kind of take, you know, maybe the same exercises that you would give one person and give it to somebody else, but give them a different, you know, focus on how to perform it. Um, And I think that could totally change the results that they get. Yeah, I think so too. I'm big time with you on that. I think people, I suppose like uh, um, in general, it'd be great to show people where like this super intense area is and then a, a more relaxed area is and not maybe spend all of my time in the middle at this like kind of eight out of 10 area. And yeah, just to take it even a bit further, which is like people need to learn, I think, a lot of the time to create or to drive intensity through different parts of the body. Like if it just I think there's a lot of the PRI stuff works for people who are just bracing all of the time. Right. There's so much brace. They're creating all their like irradiation is an FRC term or a term that they use. Like they're bracing so much there. And then there's not much going on distally. There's not much grounding or pushing through the floor as much. So a lot of the time, the, I think the PRI stuff works well to help people let go of them, go of those co-contractions proximally. But what they often miss is like, you actually never develop anything distally. There's no, 
I've never seen a PRI person do plyometrics. Like, no. So that doesn't, and, and in fairness to them, like, that's, that's not part of their system. Right. It's not their thing, but like, that's what a lot of people need. They need more, in, to my, in my mind at least, they need way more intensity distally. And actually, I see, that, I see you doing that, a lot of that with what people might call accessory work is like just funnier ways to load more, more local tissues. But you seem to load them with a lot of intensity with people. Yeah, I think that's probably the biggest component of my program is, you know, I hate to use the word variability because people kind of throw that around loosely now. But um, as far as the program itself, you know, it's kind of set up in a way to hit all of those different things. You know, I have different sections of the training where it's like, okay, now we're going to do a heavy back squat. um, But then immediately we're going to go into a plyometric where maybe there's a focus on um, I, I know I've heard you talk about it before. I think you call it like a yielding plyo where you're getting real deep into, you know, um, almost kind of like passive tissues, like kind of just letting yourself um, eccentrically fall into a position. There's that component of it. There's the stiffness oriented plyos. You can even have things kind of somewhere in between. You can have really deep plyos where you still have an emphasis on stiffness. Um, you have accessory work where the aim is to maybe focus on, you know, getting good co-contractions, contracting a lot. Then you have some instances where the goal is just to kind of learn how to relax. Um, Like I think the supine hamstring bridge that you have a lot of people do is a great exercise to kind of demonstrate that where you have some, sometimes the emphasis is to kind of contract your glutes and your hamstrings and your foot as hard as you can sometimes you're trying to let the glutes relax a little bit. I've noticed when I do that, um, I can get a much better contraction in the hamstring. And so it's not about like picking and choosing one way to do things. I think a lot of people get stuck in, okay, we're going to do it the PRI way, or we're going to do it the plyometric way where you got to, you know, be really stiff all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, or it's just super heavy bracing. Um, you know, depending on the person, if, if, you have somebody from a powerlifting background, you might want to shift gears and kind of go in the opposite direction for a little while, especially if that's kind of the uh, adaptation that they're used to driving all the time. But I think once you get, it's all about getting people kind of into a balanced place where they can do a little bit of everything Mm -hmm. um, and not, you know, like just fall apart, right? You give some people one thing that they're already doing a lot of and it might send them over the edge. And so I think, getting people into, again, just a balanced place where they can train a little bit of everything is kind of the ultimate goal. I think that's the best place to be in um, because your body can kind of respond as it needs to, to different things. And you're just better prepared overall. Sounds so simple. Yeah, (laughs) it does. It sounds simple, but the application is very complex sometimes. It is is, because you're going to drive adaptations in one way or the other um a lot of the time and people would but be already biased by their structure and their training history and their injury history towards one thing more of the other that's why i do like to think about i just think kind of rehab and training as like still the same thing for the most part it is just training just meeting someone where they're at and trying to nudge them forward but like i suppose the tractor going past my window <laughs> I don't know. Can you hear that? But um, a little bit. He's collecting the bales out in the field. <laughs> but um, uh, I can't even remember what I was saying there. But yeah, I can't fucking remember. Never mind. You, um, you were saying you were saying. Well, I don't even know. You didn't get to it. I was saying something good. I was saying I was saying something good. I always say something good. But um, it was you were saying something about meeting people where they were at. Yeah. Um. Yeah. You know, oh. with training, I guess, in terms of like. This is where, this is where, this is what they've been doing. And then this is kind of maybe where they need to go and temporarily like changing focuses, I guess. This is what, exactly. This is what I'm saying. So I I like to think of training as a skill. So like there is a skill of being able to brace under a high load when you need to. Right. There's a skill of being able to sink into a movement. So there's a speed which are plyometric, but you're not short in ground contact time. Then there's a skill of a plyometric where you're there's a lot of speed involved in the movement in the air you're dropping but there's a short ground contact time so you need to overcome so like obviously the more you train one of these qualities the more you're gonna get better at one and maybe get a little bit worse at the other 
But if you learn all of these skills, the best athletes can kind of do a little bit of everything. And I think looking at it as, for me at least, looking at it as skill development, teaching these people, teaching people all these different skills opens so many doors for them. You can just go and fucking train with whoever or whatever gym they want and they'll be able to stand in with some of their guys, not be the best person in the room, but they'll be able to mix it with them. I think that's a cool yeah. thing to teach people. I think that too. And, you know, people always talk about specificity, but I think in a lot of ways, some people need anti-specificity because you take, you know, you give people all of these different things, Right. And then, you know, you'll have some people that will make the argument and rightfully so, you know, I think if you're not playing a sport, this might be true, but you know, it's like, if, well, if you just do a lot of bracing, you're going to get stiff. Um, but it's like, okay, well, maybe we're just doing a little bit of bracing, but then you got to also consider all the volume that you're accumulating when they're playing their sport too. So the sport in a way, it kind of gives you this, um, in my opinion, it almost kind of gives you like this safety net where you can kind of explore other things and reap a lot of the benefit, the secondary benefits that those things also offer, right? Like if you're going to do a heavy squat, you might be bracing a lot, but then there's benefits there in terms of like secondary adaptations for the tendons, obviously um, just building the motor in terms of, you know, getting better at jumping. Uh, and so there's that side of it, but then you also have the sport, which kind of in a way almost drowns out some of the negative adaptations that you're getting just because of the sheer amount of volume that you get. And then, you know, maybe you have somebody, I think this applies a lot more when you're talking about like general population. Um, if you take somebody that's never done a plyometric and you just have them do a ton of strength training for two or three years, I think that's when you run into a lot of issues mm -hmm. because that's all you've done. You know, you haven't exposed them to anything else. And then you try to, and you're like, okay, well, the strength training is bad because of this. Yeah. And it's like, well, maybe you just didn't do anything else during that time. You know, just do it. If, if you, if that during that time, you just that stood up on a box at the end of your strength training and just did or at the start and just like stepped off a box five <laughs> for five reps. Every time you did that, both of them would have complimented each other so well. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I yeah. had an exact conversation with, um, with a client yesterday who, uh, she wants to get back into run, uh, more running, hasn't been running recently for the last maybe couple of years. And she said that her boyfriend, I think it was, they were on a big, um, they were on a big long trail walk. And like the way he just, the way he just, they came to a big tree stump and the way he just kind of hurdled over the tree stump and she had to like slowly, <laughs> nego slowly negotiate yeah. it. And she's been doing a lot of strength for, uh, for many years now. And I said like, you can keep deadlifting and squatting for 10 years when you come to that tree stump at no stage, will you ever think I'm going to jump over this tree stump? You're always going to want to do a step up and then step down rather than actually jump. So that, that has to be specific in that way. Yeah, 100%. And I think that's, you know, that's the benefit of, you know, uh, working things in tandem. You know, a lot of people do phases and there's nothing wrong with that, but you know, they phase things in and out or they focus on just one thing at a time and, that's why I'm such a big fan of taking, you know, whatever it is you're doing and whether it's, you know, your main goal is to get stronger, but to also add in plyometrics. Um, you know, people talk about the interference effect all the time, but, you know, I think when you're actually getting into kind of the nitty gritty programming details of what the interference effect actually is, um, you know, it's people doing astronomical volumes of, you know, endurance and then, okay, obviously the strength is going to suffer or they're just doing a ton of strength work and then the plyometrics suffer. And so I think when you kind of take this approach of, you know, just having a little bit of everything in there, um, you really can have the best of both worlds. In my opinion, you can get stronger, you can get faster. Um, I mean, I've been training that way for the past four or five years. I've been training clients that way for, for the past four or five years. It doesn't mean that you don't occasionally shift your focus especially if you do get somebody that, that comes in that has a very, you know, like a deficit oriented problem where they've just never done any plyometrics or they've just never done any strength work. But I think to kind of set your program up around this like general sort of template that you have where you can kind of, you know, plug and drop a lot of different things and then say, okay, this is where you're at. Maybe we're going to raise the scale of strength just a little bit, or maybe, this is where you're at and we need to, you know, knock the strength down just a little bit and up the plyos. Um, I think 
you, you don't even have to completely revamp or overhaul your entire training program. You can still have the same general focus and template. Um, you, you can kind of just tweak things a little bit. And I think that's the value of, you know, doing a little bit of everything and not spiking or, or putting too much importance in any one thing. And I think a lot of people tend to do that. Um, and it's okay to have a bias, obviously we all do. Um, but there has to be a balance there at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So how, how can you talk us through your programming a little bit more in terms of, so are you, you're running remote coaching at the moment? Yeah. Is that, is that a well, group? Is that a group coaching or one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, so so I do in person and I do remote coaching. And basically the way it's set up is, you know, I have, uh, let's say I have 60 or 70 people that sign up for their remote coaching. All of them, I start them all on a very similar program just to kind of assess, you know, where they're at um, based on like the feedback that I get from their videos. I can say, okay, maybe we need to cut the strength back a little bit, or maybe you're in season. So we need to, you know, upper lower. Uh, the strength or the plyometric work a little bit, but I like to, I like to start them on almost the same thing. Um, just, unless they come in with an obvious injury or limitation, then it's modified. Um, but if they're just coming in and they just say, Hey, I play baseball, I want to throw harder and I want to do X, Y, and Z. And I don't have a lot of obvious limitations. I'm going to start everybody on something pretty similar where they have, you know, maybe two upper body days, two lower body days, it's a blend of plyos, strength work. There might be some FRC based stuff in there. Um, it's going to be a good blend of everything. Right. And then based on how they kind of feel on that after about a month and just kind of me assessing their videos um, and then just getting feedback from them. That is the great thing with a lot of the clients that I work with now is they're really good at being able to provide the kinds of feedback that I need uh, to be able to modify their training. And so based on that, then it kind of becomes more individualized over time. So I have a lot of people that will start, you know, I might have three people that do the exact same thing on month one. And by the time they get to month eight, they might all be doing completely different programs. Um, and so it's kind of a blend of like, uh, like a cus like a template and then customized as well. And I think that's the best way to go because you'll have a lot of people that will sign up, especially for like remote coaching. It's a lot harder when you're working with people online, you'll have people that sign up and they say, I need to do X, Y, and Z because I fucked my knee up and I did this and I did that. And you could easily build a program around what you think the, what you think the client needs based on what they said, you know, and it just not even be close, right? You might have somebody <laughs> Yeah, because they just don't know. They might have, or they might read, you know, something that you posted. They might read something that I posted. They might read, and it, it, they have this jumble fuck of just information. And they're like, well, I need to do more ISOs, you know, because David said so. And then they might read my post and say, well, I, I need to do more hack squats because Grant said so. And so it's like, well, let's just start out with something basic instead of what you think. And then it can become this kind of this dance between what I think you need and what you think you need based on the feedback that you're giving me. Yeah. Um, and I think in my opinion, when you're not working with people in person, that's the best way to do it. I think even in person, that's a great way to do it. You know, you got 10, 20 athletes. Um, you'll have them, you have them come in and just do a basic, you know, program. Um, and then based on kind of how they progress and the limitations that you're seeing, then you can start to layer on more specific things. You can say, okay, everybody's doing a back squat over here, but I want you to come over here and do a goblet squat. Or, hey, when you're done with the workout, you know, stay for an extra five or 10 minutes and let's give you this drill because I think it's going to help you. Um, or even let's do the exact same program, but let me give you a different cue and a different focus, um, you know, on this exercise that everybody else is doing at the same time. Um, so that's, I think there's different ways that you can individualize it from an external standpoint, like actually changing the exercises. And then there's also ways that you can individualize it from an internal standpoint, which is where I like to start. Because if you have a really good balanced program, you're probably hitting enough of everything for it to be somewhat okay for most people. And then, you know, those little adjustments that they need to make, you can kind of 
tailor that with the cues or, you know, the internal focuses that they're putting into those exercises. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm with you. So I think, uh, and hopefully, like, if I, I suspect you're getting athletes who are like bought in and are pretty smart, actually. I don't mean just athletes, but clients, but like people are people, gen pop people are way smarter now. For, for, oh, for yeah. Good, for good and bad, but like, yes. I have people coming in who are, some, sometimes it's a bad thing, but like get, getting dumber is never a good thing, but like right. you know, sometimes <laughs> a bad thing, there's too much mumbo jumbo in their head, but like, yes. It's, they're getting harder to bullshit at the same time. There is like, there are people, there is good info on social media out there for people, and people are getting smarter. <laughs> Um, and sometimes like a, a, a more generic program like that, or a lot, actually a lot of the time, a generic ish program that you think is, is quite valuable based on how, you know, you would like someone to maybe progress over the next six months and, um, can be, can be very good. And if they're relatively smart, then you can kind of just say, you either need to do a little bit less or you need to do a little bit more or push a little bit harder or take it a bit easier to begin with. So like I'm with you. Ba- that my lower body basics program is like was ro- written in mind of okay I could have pretty much anyone coming into me here now, yep. uh, and what I might do in sessions like one to three, and this is a rehabby thing. So it's not like I'm driving people into the ground. I need to. I I wrote it thinking I need to be very safe with people because there's going to be like people with chronic pain, chronic knee pain. That if I do something wrong here, or they do something wrong, or this if this isn't right they might not be able to walk down the stairs for a week genuinely. So I have to, yeah. like, there's a lot of floor based stuff, but I love when people do that program first before coming to me, because one, they've given me a little bit of money, but more than that <laughs> is more than that is like, they, I just, my, my, when they've done that, all the other things they tell me are fine. But I say, what did you like from the program? What was good? What did you really struggle with that? And, and like the amount of information they give me from, okay, I couldn't do that exercise with my hips, but I could do this one, blah, 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 blah. And like, it's, it's almost more information than I'll get from just an assessment of here's your movement. Exactly. I'll know so much about it. So I think that's good. I, th- I would encourage a lot of people to write a generic-ish program, just for people that yes. are listening. Even if you're not going to give it to people, but think about writing a generic-ish program of but movements that you value and like some kind of rough set and rep, rep scheme and that will help clear a lot of things up in people's mind yeah and i th- well i think the problem that a lot of people have with generic programs is that they're not thinking they're not thinking about those common limitations right they're just saying okay here's a squat here's a bench here's a deadlift and that's what people think about when they think of a generic program, as opposed to like what we're doing, where we're actually thinking about the stuff that we're putting in people's programs. And there's a lot of thought that goes into it. And I think people also save themselves a lot of time, you know, with uh, like, let's say somebody did want to sign up for your remote coaching, it would almost be better for them to say, okay, here's my three week program, do that first, you know, and maybe get really good at that. And then when you come into the online coaching, then we can get a little more specific, you know, because like I have some people that will, uh, it's it's not a big complaint, but it has been a complaint with, I can maybe think of like two or three people in the past where I've specifically told them, do my three week program first and see how you like it. Um, And then you'll have some people that will just go straight into the remote coaching. And, you know, if they're not, I offer like a six month kind of commitment where they can do that and just, you know, okay, six months, you're going to write it out or you can pay a little bit more and do it month by month. And you'll have some people that'll do the month by month. And they're like, oh, well, you know, I feel like, um, you know, it's, it's a little too just like template oriented for me. You know, I feel like you're not like adjusting things. I'm like, well, one, are you making progress? You know, which a lot of, a lot of that progress you could have gotten out of the way doing the three week program. And then you could have came into the remote coaching and said, okay, now let's specify things a little bit more. So I I always try to get people down that, that road of like, okay, well, let's just try this first, do the three week program. Cause you can repeat it for a while. You know, you could do it, you know, probably up to six months, maybe even a year and, and still make good progress. And then at that point, then you can come into the remote coaching and now we've kind of filter out all the things that, um, you know, you're good at and that you don't need anymore. And we can get a little bit more specific. And so I think a general template 
you know, does work really well for most people like that, especially when it is designed with the goal in mind that, you know, you're chasing a lot of different qualities and adaptations and you're not just giving somebody a five by five, you know, squat bench and deadlifts, right. Which nothing fine, nothing wrong with that. If that's what you want to do. Um, but I, I do think that tends to be one of the biggest issues with people, you know, going into these, uh, generalized training programs is they have this idea that it's just going to be, uh, something super generic and basic when it doesn't have to be. Yeah. Generic, generic, like I think generic needs to be general in terms of a lot of different qualities that you're trying to develop. And I think a lot of programs are, um, generic but they're too specific to one yeah. quality now that's fine if you are a power lifter only but ge- ge- generic and general go very well together and same as that if, if i i pretty much i won't take on a lower body client unless they've done lower body basics first i just won't because i'm just like just fucking do that because i'm going to give you some of this stuff anyway and you're going to be shit yeah. at it for a month anyway so just do it first and then, yeah. and then we can talk um, yeah so yeah and they, they they learn some stuff so um tell me about kind of recovery nutrition sleep light all that stuff so i think you're you're big into um some of that do you have your own like nutrition brand stuff now supplement yeah brand stuff. yeah so i came out with a magnesium supplement um probably about three months ago and so that's been you know going pretty well just because you know, I have, I think for me, um, yeah, it's funny that we've just talked about training. Cause like it's 50, 50 with me, like it, in terms of, you know, half of my attention is kind of geared towards training. And then the other half is like heavily influenced, um, by like, you know, nutritional paradigms and things like that. That was kind of, you know, one of the biggest things that I was into way before I even like was training. Um, I was super into nutrition and health. And so I think that's a big missing component, uh, for a lot of people. And I think just like training, there's certain things in the nutrition world that get wrongfully demonized like supplements. Um, because you have a lot of people that have kind of these, um, you know, just like people would think about, you know, maybe like a general training program, they have this idea in their head about like what nutritional supplements entail, which is usually, um, you know, pump products and pre-workouts and, you know, shit that maybe has its place for some people, but that, you know, for the most part is, it's just a lot of marketing hype. Um, you know, take this and gain five pounds of muscle, you know, type products. And so I've really focused on trying to get people more into, um, nutrition and supplements kind of through the lens of like, how can we fill some of these big gaps, you know, like, just like you would with, um, some of these like niche the, the things that like people would look at and, and see us doing as kind of like niche training things um, with supplements. I think it's kind of the same where there's a lot of things that people are missing the boat on in terms of just foundational stuff that they could do to massively improve um, how they feel, how they sleep. So, you know, for me, I think the biggest thing would just be minerals. So that's why I released a, uh, a magnesium supplement. I think that's a really big mineral that a lot of athletes especially are um, deficient and lacking in. And I think that plus um, I have another product that I recommend called Shilajit. You've probably seen me talk about that. It's basically just a multi-mineral. Um, it's, you know, just a compact. Um, it's almost like the best way to describe it would be like you're eating like soil almost (laughs) like it's just a concentrated source of like uh just minerals and uh it 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 literally tastes terrible it tastes almost exactly like what you would imagine eating dirt tastes like (laughs) um but it's just rich in all these minerals right there's no it's not like a magic exiler for like uh disease or something a lot of people think of it as kind of like this weird sounding herb but it's really just minerals um And so that's kind of where I focus a lot of my attention is like, what are people deficient in? Um, Just like you would with training, you know, what movement limitations do people have? And then the nutrition side of that would be, okay, what uh, nutrient deficiencies do most people struggle with, especially if they're training hard, you know, they're athletes and they're sweating a lot. And so the biggest thing is going to be 
stuff like magnesium and like trace minerals. And so I focus a lot of my supplement and nutrition recommendations around um, kind of replenishing those. And you'll notice when people do that for the first time, you know, it's like a 180 in how they feel. Um, not because it's magic, it's just basic stuff that people are lacking, right? And so you're just giving them this stuff that, you know, they're either sweating out or they're just not getting enough of in their diet. And they're like, holy shit, I feel amazing. I have more energy. I'm sleeping better. Um, I've had some people, you know, they get their testosterone levels checked and it's like, you know, in the 100s, it's like tanks. And then they start doing that for a few months. Uh, they start getting, you know, sun in the morning. They just start doing all of these really basic things. Um, and then it skyrockets, you know, and I think it's unfortunate that a lot of people are kind of looking at, you know, things like red light therapy, sun, <laughs> as fucking crazy as it sounds, it's literally just the sun, uh, and, and supplements. And they're kind of turning it into, they're saying, oh, it's just a biohack, you know, it's just a quick, and it's like, dude, it's just foundational, you know, very basic things that you can do. And so I think you, the waters kind of get muddied there when you start uh, taking things that a lot of these influencers are doing, you know, like supplements and biohacks, and then you kind of lump them in with all these other things that, you know, can really help people at the end of the day, especially if they're, um, you know, deficient or they're just not paying any attention to that side of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's some of the influencers like if you're if you're a, a body hacking or biohacker influencer you might or, or maybe you just had a page and you started off talking about sunlight and sleep and stuff like that yeah your personality became kind of linked <laughs> and your business became linked to that you have to find more and more and more biohacks to to uh talk about and sell to people so it just gets all mixed in the one same as when people have like good maybe fitness information or whatever. And then they have to like make things more and more and more fancy uh, so that they yeah. have things to talk about. So do you have, do you have the magnesium, your own product and uh, Sheila G as well, or just the magnesium right now? Yeah. yeah. How, did you, so the... how did you do that? Like how, if I want to start my own, whatever brand, like how do I even, how do I even do that? To be, to be honest, dude, it was the easiest thing I've ever done. Um, I thought, I mean, there were parts of it that it was a long process. Um, but basically, you know, I just emailed, uh, I literally just Googled supplement manufacturers and I found the one that had the highest rating and I kind of did some research on them. And, um, you know, I wanted to make sure obviously that it was a facility that, you know, tests all their stuff, um, and products for like, you know, heavy metals and things like that before it actually goes into the product. And so, um, I kind of, you know, just did some research in that regard, but then once I found the company that I wanted to use, um, it was super simple. I just sent them an email and they basically, you know, just asked me, what do you want in it? Um, you know, what's kind, what, what's the product geared towards? Um, and then that was pretty much it, dude. It was just a long back. It just took a long time. It was probably like a six to eight month process of like them saying, Hey, what color do you want the artwork to be on the logo? And I would say blue. And then they would respond back like two weeks later, you know, cause they just have so many. <laughs> Yeah, inquiries. And then they would say, okay, how many units do you want? And they'd be like 1500 and they would take another three weeks. And so it, I mean, it was the simplest overall process in terms of this is what I want it to look like. This is how many units I want. This is what I want in it. Um, and then that was pretty much it. Uh, I just had to wait so long for them to kind of get it finalized and everything. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, the, honestly, the hardest part of it was you know, setting up like the Shopify integration with the um, fulfillment center, for whatever reason, the fulfillment center that I chose, uh, just made that more of a hassle than it needed to be. <laughs> but other than that, it was simple. Um, you know, you just find a good company, email them, and that's pretty much it. You know, you just got to know exactly what you want in it, obviously, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, I've, I've known that for a while, just recommending supplements and things to people, but that's, that's the one I have now. And then Sheila Jeet, I just recommend to people, um, that's going to be a little bit harder to get made just because you have to source it from Russia. And obviously there's a lot of BS going on with that. So I'm not sure if I want to, you know, dip my feet in that just yet, but yeah, the Sheila Jeet, I'm hoping probably within the next year, I'll be able to have that out to people. Yeah. Nice, man. The, um, yeah, the Shopify stuff, I've been, that's like, 
that's a thing we need to set up soon, which is so just some of our like just t shirts, different things like yeah. that. Um, but I wasn't ready to delve into a project, which is like, <laughs> yeah. I figured this out because I actually don't have a clue. So, you don't hand do you handle the product? You don't ship anything, it just it's, it's going somewhere else and they ship it for you. Yeah, so it just it all goes to my uh, fulfillment center, which is actually I just chose the uh, the company that manufactures my product. I just use their fulfillment service. Um, but that yeah, that was the biggest thing for me is like I'm very uh, I like ideas and and I like you know putting out information, but I hate doing practical shit. I'm not. I have literally the worst tech skills. The guy that I was on the phone with. Um, helping me with the fulfillment side goes, you don't have a tech guy. And I'm like, Nope, <laughs> I need that for this. Why do I need that for this? Yeah. You know, and it, it was just, it ended up not being that big of a deal, but that's kind of like, I'm almost hesitant to do certain things now with certain components of uh, like my Shopify and my website could be so much better. I just need to find somebody to help me, you know, do the things that I want with it so that it's not half-assed. And that I don't have a bunch of problems with it because that's, that's the worst part is like, if I delve into that and I try to do it myself and then there's an issue and then people can't buy the product, you know, so there's definitely components of it that are a little nerve wracking, but I think overall, um, you know, it wasn't too bad to figure out, but yeah, that's, that, that was my biggest fear going into it is like, God, I'm going to have to do all this tech bullshit and yeah. it ended up not being too bad, but yeah. I know I'm the same on that. I've had so many like ideas uh every fucking day i think of oh we should do this we should do this <laughs> yeah uh, and i need to prioritize but like the tech is hard because the reason it's so hard is i i know i won't be able to do it myself like eventually we'll run into a problem that i just can't solve the yep. biggest the bigger issue is i could try and hire like a tech person or like contract out to a tech person but i don't even know they could be completely bullshitting me yes and like charge me yes. for something and just not doing it and i have no idea if, if like just don't have a clue so yeah that's the hard part yeah that's why you got to have some sympathy for people that don't know anything about training because it's the same thing when they're going to choose a pt you know that's that's the exact issue that i've had with tech people i'm like i don't know who to talk to like who's good and who's not you know i don't i don't have any criteria for that you know and then my worst fear is like what if they get mad at me and they decide they're going to like steal my information and like <laughs> just wipe out my website or something, you know? Yeah, exactly. Just lock you out. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a real, um, the tech world is murky. Like, so I don't know. I don't know. It is. We, yeah. have, we have people, we have people like for our website, but then they're not doing our marketing side of things or like right. do our Shopify stuff or at least they probably would, but like, it's not, it's not, they wouldn't be good at it. So like, I trust yeah. you, but that's not their field. So um, anyway, so let's, let, uh, second last question. If you were to, um, if you were to get injured in the morning, like aside from, I know you can add in some of your like training kind of ideas, like what? Because I've seen you use the red light and stuff. I, I recommend that a little bit, not too much. I'm not too hard on it, but if it was me, I'd use it myself. I just throw it on every single day or every single morning. So like, you have a kind of a broad template that you could say, okay, I would do like lots of reps of an exercise for blood flow. I would use the light. I would use a certain supplement. I would make sure I was doing X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Um, you know, I think with supplements and gadgets and things, you know, there's kind of this idea that anything that's passive um, doesn't work. And I think people have this view of passive modalities is, is like, oh, we're just going to cup or we're going to do some dry needling and stuff. And so when you, when you really look at a lot of those things, a lot of them are passive in the sense that it's just like trying to manipulate tissue. Um, so from that standpoint, it would make sense why people would, um, you know, not necessarily reach towards those things as like, you know, one of their first go-to strategies because they're more or less all kind of the same thing, cupping, massage, you know, it's all the same kind of mechanism and i'm not saying there can't be a time and place for that either but mm -hmm. i think when i, I look think, at the i think even those things work I for mean, sure if you ask any fucking athlete in the world they will all say i feel better after i have a massage exactly yeah so even just from like a psychological standpoint yeah but i think you do almost have to differentiate between like 
what has a very strong mechanism of, of getting somebody better, I guess you could say for lack of a better word, like with the red light. Um, and I'm no expert in red light. I just like to use it, you know, but I like to tell people that, you know, it's just, it sounds kind of weird and esoteric, but it's basically just stimulating, um, the mitochondria in your cells to be able to produce more energy, which obviously, you know, is a big, uh, kind of component in healing and just, you know, all of those cellular cascades and processes that go into, uh, tissue healing. So red light is one of my favorites for that because, it, it does have a very clear mechanism on how it's actually going to benefit you. Um, so, you know, red light is one of those things where if you can afford it, it's great because it is kind of expensive. It's about two, 300 bucks if you're going to buy like a small panel. Um, but I tell a lot of athletes, you know, it's, it's a great thing to buy and have on hand, you know, especially if you're not, if you're an athlete, you're probably spending a lot of money on a lot of different things. I know athletes will go and buy, a six or $700 massage gun because they think it's valuable, but then they'll cringe at a two to $300 red light, you know, just because they don't understand. Yes. They don't feel it and they don't understand, you know, the, maybe the benefit that it has as well. And so I always tell people like, if you have to choose one or the other, get a red light. Um, I also love shockwave therapy. I think in PT, for some reason, I think that's downplayed a little bit, probably because uh, there aren't a lot of studies done on, on it for different issues. Like if it's really good for like knees and shoulders, as far as like the studies that I've seen on it. But, um, I mean, I've used that on people that have had back pain and I don't try to differentiate between, oh, you have back pain because you're, uh, you know, some psycho emotional issue is causing it, or maybe it's a structural issue. I'm like, let's just try a bunch of things and see what works. Um, I've had tons of people that have had success with, uh, the shockwave therapy for back pain, um, elbow pain. I think in terms of just like getting somebody out of pain quickly, that's really underrated. I don't know why people don't use that more. I don't know why it, there's not more studies on it, but red light and shockwave therapy, as far as like passive stuff goes, mm -hmm. I think are two of the best, um, Supplement wise, I would say <clears throat> maybe BPC 157, that's a peptide. That's really good for injuries. Um, so out of, you know, like just the three biggest things that I could think of from like a passive modality standpoint, it would be red light, BPC 157, that's a supplement. Um, and then the shockwave therapy, you know, and then just as far as you have a you training have a is concerned. Do you have a brand you recommend for the red light? Uh, yeah. So there's two. There's um, uh, Jimbo Red and uh, Mito Red. And so you have to be pretty. I probably should have mentioned this before because with red light, you know, it's very, um, it's a weird kind of market now where a lot of people are getting into it. And so because of that, it's become oversaturated with a lot of people you know, not choosing the right wavelengths, right? There's obviously, you know, if you go within, you know, one to two degrees of, you know, the proper wavelength that you're supposed to use in terms of, you know, the, the, the light frequency, um, it might not work at all, right? And so uh, Jimbo Red and uh, Mito Red both use all of the wavelengths that are actually tested, you know, that they use in all of the studies uh, for red light therapy. I think Jimbo Red is probably maybe even a little bit better just because the panels don't heat up as much, which can be an issue for some people. Um, and they're a little bit cheaper, you know, if you buy like a small portable one. Um, I think those are two of the best because they don't give a, off a lot of heat um, or the Jimbo Red doesn't, they don't give a lot of uh, EMF off. You know, that's kind of a controversial topic with a lot of people is, you know, does EMF have harmful effects? I would just rather go with a device that had less EMF I think that's just probably um, a better, you know, safer idea. Uh, and then flicker is another big thing. So basically a lot of red light panels will have what's called flicker, which is basically, you can't really see it, um, but your brain can kind of pick it up, uh, which is, it's basically just the light um, flickering on and off really fast. And so for a lot of people that have neurological issues, that can be a concern. It can cause eye strain. Um, and just like overstimulation in people, especially if you're using it at night. So 
Jimbo Red and Mito Red are probably two of the best, in my opinion, because they're low EMF. They have uh, clinically tested wavelengths. Those are the wavelengths that they have in their products. And then they're, uh, they have low flicker as well. So those are like three things that you want to look for if you are going to buy a device. Um, sometimes, you know, if you live in another country, you might not be able to get one of those. So if you go on their website or just on any website that sells a red light panel, it would be good to look for those qualifications and kind of make sure that they're, yeah, covering those three bases. Yes. And would you put, uh, so you put it up nice and close to the area and for how long? Yeah. So typically if you have an acute injury, you would want to, you, you want skin contact. Um, if you're using it for other purposes, like uh, circadian benefits, um, it has a lot of benefits for uh, sleep and mood. So at night, you know, you can shine it on your ceiling just to kind of give off some ambient light uh, instead of using uh, a lot of blue light at night. Um, you know, I've had a lot of people uh, fall asleep within like five or 10 minutes of having that on, you know, it's a great way to, to get to sleep faster. You can also use it in the morning, kind of setting it up, you know, kind of far away from you um, and kind of letting your eyes catch some of the light directly in the morning to uh, give you more energy. But if you're using it for injuries, you want it to be, you want skin contact. Um, so a lot of the light will actually bounce off your skin. Uh, if you, you know, you're not using it directly against the, the tissue that you're trying to, um, you know, heal. So you want it directly up against the skin. And if it's a fresh injury, uh, two times a day for 20 minutes, you know, with maybe like a five to six hour window, uh, in between would probably be your best bet, you know, do that for like maybe a week or two. And then, uh, after that, you know, you do get to a point where there's kind of that dose dependent response where if you're using it too much, then obviously it kind of loses some of its benefits. Um, it, it, do, it doesn't really harm you in any way. Um, I mean, if you were to use it excessively, like an hour a day, there could be some uh, free radical or, you know, oxidative stress type uh, downsides to it. But, you know, I think it's always better to kind of mega dose it initially when you do, if you did have like an acute injury and then kind of just wean off it um, because you're not really going to see any additional benefits using it two times a day, as opposed to just once. So two times a day, one to two weeks for an acute injury. And then you can kind of taper it down to uh, maybe once a day or even once every other day, you can still get a lot of great benefits, um, you know, using it uh, just every other day for 10 to 20 minutes. And then um, I think, you know, with the red light, it's, it's also one of those things too, where you need to be consistent with using it in terms of if you're going to use it on and off, you know, like you're going to take breaks, it would be best to almost like, if you can't use it every day, it would be best to use it like three times a week. And these are the days you're going to use it as opposed to going a week on and then just, you know, not using it at all. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of how I would use it for injuries for an, for an acute injury. If you have an injury where you don't really know, you know, what the cause of it might be like, it's just kind of like a chronic thing. I find that it doesn't work as well for that kind of stuff. Um, obviously much, because there's not much healing taking place or it doesn't need to be as much healing. Taking it, place. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it's still worth a shot. You know, you could try it because it's just, it's hit or miss sometimes, but, um, you could try it maybe once a day or just even follow the same protocol, do it for a week and then kind of taper off. But yeah, I, I found that a lot of those passive things like the BBC, the red light, the, even the shock wave, um, they don't work as well if, it, if you don't know why you have the pain or the injury, right? If you sprain your ankle or you have, um, you know, a nagging tendon issue, you can usually kind of pinpoint it like, okay, I spiked my training load here or, um, you know, obviously I sprained my ankle. So that stuff, it's going to be very um, useful for. And then with some of those chronic issues, it can just, it's hit or miss, honestly. There's much more, much more brain involved at that stage. Exactly. Maybe, maybe you should be shining it on your brain at that stage. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> honestly, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's good. Look, I'm a movement guy. Like I, I love movement. I love biomechanics. I love loading people all that stuff but like 
people might roll their eyes at some of the red light and supplements mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But like at the end of the day, if I was especially if I was a professional athlete, my career relied on me being fit and healthy and playing. If I fucking got injured, I'd be shining red light on me. Yeah, so I would put it anywhere you told me to put it yep. on if I thought it might help. So um, yeah, and I've and I've seen maybe it's placebo, but like I've seen people people feeling better as a result of doing that stuff. So yeah. And well, I don't see the negative, so I don't. That's the that's the important part. It's like, so yeah, it's, same with some of the supplements and stuff. I like if you don't do anything stupid, I don't think it's going to going to cause any harm. So fuck it, you may as well try it. Yeah, that's the thing. You know, for me in my world, it's like it's worth a shot at the very least. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's worth a shot, and then obviously it's not like it's detracting from any of the other proven things that you're supposed to be doing as well. You can layer it on top of that stuff too. Exactly. Um, uh, and then I think just. You know, if it helps somebody, it helps them. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Uh, sometimes it's hit or miss. Sometimes it works really great. Um, but yeah, you know, it's not like it's something you need. But especially when, when you're talking about athletics, you know, these people are on a timeline, right? You, you don't have a whole lot of time to, you know, especially if somebody has to play again, you got to just throw everything at them uh, because there's, you know, they got to get back on the field and play soon. Yeah, good sleep, good nutrition, bit of red light and like, a thousand or a couple of thousand reps a day uh, yep. at the local area nice and light exactly. high volume i've seen people come back from injuries where like they should not have been back from yep. very quickly so um so yeah we just don't want to put a limit on like okay this is how long the recovery time is hmm, maybe not um, exactly okay last question generic question which i can't, i forgot to ask the last several people <laughs> uh you're on a desert island for a week um, you can bring three people with you that you'd kind of like to like learn from. Who are they? Who would you bring? Ooh, um, three people that I could learn from. I would say in fitness. You know, it's hard for me to think in terms of fitness. Well, I want I want to throw one in there just for people that maybe you know have somebody to like look into and I guess gain some information from. Um. Man, that's dude, it's hard. I'm like so much in my own world now that I just don't even like I hate to say that I don't learn from other people because I absolutely do. But in terms like I used to put just people on a pedestal in terms of like coaching and now I don't do that anymore. So it's like hard to think about. But yeah. um oof, man. They can be dead also. Okay. Um Magic Islands, like lost. Ah man. I want to give I want to give a coaching one though because I think people would take some value away from that. Uh, so there was a coach. Well, okay, uh, you know who Christian Thibodeau is? Yeah. So I used to love his stuff. I, I consumed a ton of his content for the longest time um, because I think he had a really unique perspective on training, just from a lot of the clients that he worked with. Um, I think, you know he's kind of like Charles Poliquin in a way, like some of the stuff might not be uh, right, but some of it might be. And I think when you kind of get into that like realm of like learning about training and fitness, you kind of have to like try and think about a lot of different things and kind of put a lot of ideas out there. And I liked his take on training because he kind of, him and Poliquin both, um, they, they just didn't give a fuck. They were willing to like look at and try anything. Um, so I would say maybe him. And then uh, I actually, he's a close friend of mine. His name is Kevin Foster. I'm not sure if you follow him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, there are very few people that I think have really good, thoughtful um, takes on just like not only training but just life in general I think he's a really good thinker and I think there's not too many people in this industry um that are just really good thinkers <laughs> you know it's like they maybe they have the training side of things down um but not the ability to kind of like synthesize all of that information and and think about it in like a very uh practical way I guess and so he would definitely be one of them uh for anybody listening I would definitely go check out his page. Um, he doesn't post as much as he used to anymore. I think he's kind of taken a little bit of a break from social media. Um, 
ja- is but he, he would be is he is his tag javelin anatomy it was, yes I think, was it yeah. yes that's him yeah that's yeah so javelin anatomy for people listening um not just for if you're into into javelin javelin it's cool yeah that's javelin breakdowns and stuff yeah that's kind of his main thing is javelin but I love the way he can kind of take and you can read some of his posts about javelin and it can be applicable to like life. And you're like, (laughs) okay, that was, that was an interesting parallel there, you know? Um, So I really like a lot of his content because he, he kind of makes it um, applicable in a lot of different ways. And then just some of his thoughts on training in general. Uh, He's even getting kind of into like the nutrition side of things as well. And so I think, you know, just a lot of his takes are really interesting. And uh, yeah, I think anybody that's listening should definitely go check out his page. And he would be, if you haven't already had him on, he would be a great guest too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you need a number three. Oh, there's a third one. Uh, dang, dude, I'm out, man. Uh, <laughs> two is good. Two is good. Okay, cool. I don't know why. I if you told if you asked me that question like in another context, I could easily think of it. But they're just not. I'm just there's like a blank slate right now. <laughs> I was on uh, Robbie Burke's podcast there the other day i don't think it's released yet uh it probably will be by the time i release this uh all things strength and wellness is his podcast one of like the og strength um strength and conditioning podcast he's been doing a podcast for 11 years which is insane um and he asked me that question because he heard me asking other people that question and um yeah i didn't i didn't have a great answer because like i, I don't know but uh, i said tiger woods uh I already answered before Tony Robbins because I'd like to see him talking to Tiger Woods and getting in, like seeing him do the NLP stuff on him. Yeah. And um, Marcus Aurelius, they were my three. So. Okay, you just made me think of my third one, Joe Dispenza. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. I really, you know, some of his stuff might seem a little out there to some people, but I really like the core of his message, and I think uh, Joe Dispenza and maybe uh, oh, what's his name? something Silva. I can't remember his first name, but they're like both kind of in the same book in terms of like, I guess just, you know, like the mental space. And I think again, going back to like pain and injury and things that is such a massively overlooked area. So I think those would be some great, you know, guys to look into as well. Just if you already have like the physical side of training down and you have, uh, you're just very intellectual and you like to kind of focus on the nitty gritty stuff. I think those would be some great, even if you don't take all of it, even if it's a little weird to you, uh, I think the overarching theme there is a great thing that, you know, a lot of people can take away. I think so too. If you're too too logical with everything, then like just open your, open your world up a little bit to that. It would be funny to see like Joe Dispenza or someone, what if he got to the island and like, like he's all about mindset, blah, 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 or Tony Robbins, like, and they just had a <laughs> shit show. Like they just couldn't deal with it. It's like, I was thinking been, the same thing. You've been yeah, just like, living on your yacht for too fucking long. And now you can't deal with this. Yeah. <laughs> I've definitely thought about that before. Like, I wonder if you were in a different situation, if you would be the same, you'd be acting the same way, you know? It's like what they said about uh, McGregor for, was it his last fight? He was training or he was like sleeping on his Lamborghini yacht. And then he was coming in to train. Who did he fight last? Tony Ferguson, was it? And um, they said, I think, uh, was it Ferguson? I think, I don't want to be wrong. But I think, I think so. Or whoever it was, anyway, someone bet him and they said, like, you can't, you can't sleep on your yacht and come in and train with the same intensity. Like, yeah. that's just, like, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Yep. That is done. So, uh, okay, Grant, where can people find you? Or is there anything that, like, you'd like people to check out? Yeah, so the main... Uh the main place where I just post all of my content would be on Instagram. Uh, so you can find me at Fowler underscore fitness underscore SPT. Um, that's really, you know, I have obviously my website linked there with uh, my programs and my magnesium and supplements and things like that. I also have a nutrition guide where I kind of cover, um, you know, a little more in depth on, you know, some of the supplements and some of the red light and uh, you know, kind of those niche uh, little tools Um, but that's the biggest place I post pretty much all of my content on, uh, Instagram probably need to branch out a little bit. (laughs) Um, I do have a Twitter as well, but again, everything that I post on Twitter and TikTok just ends up on my Instagram as well. So Mm -hmm. if you want to see pretty much just all of my content in one place, 
uh, Instagram would be the place to go to. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks for having me on. Hey guys, David again. I hope you really enjoyed the episode with Grant. I thought it was very, very good. Um, really enjoyed the chat, learned lots myself. So make sure you um, give it a share. I, myself, I, David and Grant will both appreciate it. So um, share that on social media. And one last thing, don't forget to sign up to DGR Interactive. If you're into biomechanics movement, any of that stuff, um, that's the place to be. I, I going to make a big claim i think it's the best biomechanics education in the world so um biomechanics it doesn't mean a focus on like or looking at biomechanics doesn't mean you ignore strength or anything it actually underpins your exercise selection so that you can help make people stronger help restore movement mobility um help pick the right plyometric exercises all of that so it kind of underpins everything that we do so um dg interactive Uh, sign up there looking forward to seeing you in there and um, apart from that I'll see you for an episode next week